Hi, I'm Will. And I'm Luke. And this is Will, Will and Luke, Luke Discuss. A vodcast. And podcast. Where we discuss content related to psychology, personal growth, self-development, and well-being. This, this episode, episode, we're discussing Games People Play by Eric Byrne. Oh, nice. <laughs> Old school cover. It's, um, penguin yeah, a really... <laughs> penguin in it. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a really differently written book. Like, I'm, I'm kind of unsure what, what it is. It's like either an explanation um, that builds on upon what he wrote about transactional analysis with, with examples, and it's, uh, it's chunked very interestingly. I'm not sure if it's uh, how well it flows compared to a lot of the other books we've read, but there's certainly some um, quite big takeaway, mess- takeaway messages in there. Um, <clears throat> just got to find what applies to your life, I suppose, and that's what we'll get into tonight. I think I see what you mean. Do you mean like it's... So he explains a bit what games are, and then each chapter is just a, a list, an explanation of different games. So it's more like a reference guide. Is, is that kind yeah. of what you mean? It's not like yeah. a story. It doesn't have much of a narrative to it. No, no. And it's um, just kind of some, some bits are explained more than others. Mm. And some he elaborates on. He uses some very... Uh, I'm not sure if his examples would sit well with the modern audience. As I was reading it, I was definitely like, if someone just like rewrote this book for 2020, people would get right into it. But it's clearly just a very, very old book with some um, very interesting ideas that I, I enjoyed. But I, I certainly don't think it was a uh, um, just like a smooth, easy, interactive read. It was uh, yeah, broken up quite a lot. All right. Should we get into what we th- yeah. uh, make yeah. sure we're on the same page about w- what it is, and then we'll uh, dig into it. So, sure. I, f- I felt like I needed to get that all off my chest before <laughs> we get going. So now I can get into the good stuff. Um, all yeah. Right. All right. Here we go. Um. So games. I I I want to put. I want to try and he spends like a tiny little section of the introduction and in part one giving all the context for games and then like the whole rest of the books all about these different games. But I feel like that tiny little bit at the beginning is quite important to Yes, and the bit at the end about yeah. how to achieve how to achieve autonomy. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and so I'll give that a crack and then uh, you see what you think and fill any bits in. So he's basically sure. he's kind of saying at the start that um we're we're social and physical beings and we respond especially as infants to being touched and held and stroked and then as we grow up and develop language these strokes can take symbolic form such that you can give me a head nod or a wink and i can sort of feel stroked and in it that it meets a need we have to be sort of um acknowledged and seen positively so something as yes. easy as you walk past someone in the street say hiya they're like hey mate like something as easy as that we've just given each other a stroke and for all intents and purposes it's like we've literally stroked one another like it, we yeah. symbolize that as a um acknowledgement of our being and so mm. then these symbolized strokes get uh, structured into how we spend time with one another yes and so there's like these um, different ways in which we can interact. As if we're being social, we're going to be doing one of a handful of things. Firstly, he talks about rituals. So these are literally like scripted um, back and forth so you, that you've probably had many times. Hi there. Greetings, Hi. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> nice weather yeah. we're having. Yeah, sure is. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> bye, mate. So, bye. See ya. That like it's yeah. a it's a ritual. It's timeless. You could say that uh, it might change slightly with culture and things, but like the the words pretty much stay the same. Hmm. And then so that's really basic. Uh, it doesn't have any intimacy in it, but we it's a way for us to give each other strokes. Hmm. And then if you spend a bit more time with someone, it might turn from a ritual into a pastime. And a pastime yes. is a semi-ritualistic interaction. So, for example, we could play the pastime of sports or football, and we might be the structure of it might be the same, 
but the content will change week by week depending on what football matches we've watched and what's happening yes, in the league yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So our game of football we might play, oh, sorry, our pastime <clears throat> of football we might play now will be different from last year's, but it's pretty much the same. There's still not really any intimacy in it. It's just like semi-scripted yeah. but improvised depending on what's happening in the moment. Mm-hmm. You can play the same with like clothes and fashion or the weather or cars and these are all the pastimes he says you kind of see at like parties, cocktail parties and things. Waiting rooms. That's yeah. Thing. Chit chat, yeah. And then then the, a level, a different way to interact, which what, uh, well, I'll start with the last one because the rest of the book's about games. So yeah. one other way to interact is what he calls intimacy. Now intimacy is genuinely and honestly sharing your inner life candidly and straightforwardly like i'm like but pretty much when i saw that i was like okay so intimacy is non-violent communication <laughs> like what yes yeah nice, nice, nice. <laughs> um so i'm sharing how i feel what i want what my honest opinions are and i'm genuinely listening for yours there's no ulterior motives we're just being yes, candid yeah. straightforward honest but also deep it's not just the football scores and something that's happened it's actually what's going on within us it's li- liberated as well. It's from a, a liberated child that we'll, we'll get mm. on to. Yeah. yeah. And so the last, so that those are what I've what done. Three ways we can uh, <laughs> spend time together, ritualistically, in a pastime or intimate, with intimacy. And then the other way is, is um, games. And that's what the rest of the book's about. Yeah. yeah. And what he describes games as is um, like an ongoing series of like complementary ulterior transactions that um he says progress to well-defined predictable outcomes so it's they differ to the others because they're ulterior in quality and there is some payoff from the interaction Mm. so there's there's something else to be gained and often those sorts of interactions are quite superficial they're trying to um protect us they, they conceal our motivations and they can be quite gimmicky and he gives a lot of different examples of those so um, I'm sure we'll get onto different examples, but that's my understanding of games that they're they're typically um, you can call them like dishonest and dramatic, but often it's a bit more unconscious than that. I don't think people really like, quite realise when they are playing games. It's often yeah. So he he cover over something. He says there are two types of games: professional games and social games. And yes. you, usually in social, what he calls social games. Although there's always an ulterior motive, we, we, you, we're more often than not unconscious of our ulterior motive. And it's just at like habits we've built up through the family and through culture. So whereas in, in professional games, for example, like uh, if you're a salesman, you might consciously have an ulterior motive in what you're saying. Yes. So yeah. I think that's the difference. I, um, I really enjoyed that explanation. I think that's great. I've got a couple of things I'm, I'd like to add, um, mm. just in regards to the stroking. So, you know, talking about um, there being a, uh, you know, within social intercourse, there, there's like a, a hunger that we have. And he describes there's three types of hunger that we have mm. that require stroking. And um, those three, one is stimulus hunger, which is to avoid sensory and emotional starvation, which is mm. what you spoke about. Um, there's recognition hunger, so just a need to be recognized as human, as, as you are, as someone actually in the room. And then there's a structure hunger, which is broken into three sections, which is a material, social, and individual. So mm. a lot of structure is to avoid, avoid boredom. But mm. I think it's important just, just to recognize like, what reasons are we needing to be stroked? Is it on an, uh, an emotional level? Mm-hmm. And he, he says, um, what's that quote? I might have just read it out. He um, says, if you're not stroked, your spinal cord will shrivel up. So, so you know, it's actually really integral to us as humans and how we, we operate mm. in the world mm. is how, how we're recognised and how we're, we're stroked. And within all those interactions that you've mentioned and gone mm. through, there's, uh, there's often some, some trade-offs, maybe some expectations, the sense mm. that you owe another person a stroke. And I think that's mm. what we... Um, uh, something we spoke about at the end of the last um, podcast, warning mm. body language, was when going into a, a situation where you might be feeling uh, potentially intimidated or overwhelmed by the other person or seeing that they're quite a dominant character is that you can uh, 
provide an antithesis to that and mm. give them give them a free stroke in order to uh oh, yeah. support them to 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 feel recognized and yeah. to um acknowledge their place in that interaction yeah good um, memory yeah and I, I think this this is where it gets really interesting when it, you know it does break down into you know what are the expectations <laughs> that people mm. have in certain and, and, and when you break them and I suppose yeah. I've got I've got two examples that just absolutely like they crack me up. One yeah. is from a TV show, and one is just from this book. So yeah. there's one where um, m- maybe I- I'll explain it, and you can maybe just unpack what that that is, whether that's a pastime, a ritual, or <coughs> um, intimacy. Yeah. Um, so one example he gives is when someone goes. So if you bump into someone in mm. the uh, in the coffee room and they're uh, you go, hey, how's it going? You're right, and you've seen them every day this week, and it's yeah. Thursday, and you, you know, it's the fourth day. So you go, hey, it's all right. And they go, yeah, right, not bad. You cool, and that's acceptable. That's kind of a one for one transaction. Mm. You know, I like, give you a stroke, and, you give me one. We both know that that's what we owe each other, and that's done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then there's, uh, I think you know, where I'm going, and then <laughs> there's a guy who goes away on holiday for three weeks, <laughs> yeah. comes back, comes back into the coffee room, and if you go, hey, mate, you're right. Like, just keep it real low key. like he he need like his yeah. uh, his internal mechanisms need yeah. you to go. Hey, how was your holiday? I've not yeah. seen you in a while. And just in my head, I think about just like how much I I want to do that to people. Like just to be yeah. funny. Like I don't know. Just be like a funny thing to watch. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. So just, like this person's like dying to be like. Please like acknowledge that I've been on holiday. And I'm back <laughs> now, but, um, yeah, may- maybe you could unpack that one. For me. <laughs> yeah, it's like we, um, it's like culture imbibes us with with these expectations of how many strokes we owe each other. So, uh, if yeah. you're, for example, if you're in the British countryside, when you come across someone, you you owe them at least a stroke, probably two. It's like, oh, that was I, my next example. <laughs> oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my next example about um, how in um, this country, oh, where yeah. um, the, t- the two characters are walking <laughs> through this, um, I might as well go there, walking through this, like, open field, and this guy walks past him, and they go, you all right, mate? And he just oh, yeah. keeps walking. And doesn't <laughs> yeah. goes, what the f-? <laughs> you go, What the fuck? Do you see that? How rude. And it's like, you didn't even say hello. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. <laughs> So Sorry, yeah, Karen. if you're in the, generally, if you're in the countryside, when you, when you walk past someone, especially if you haven't seen someone for like an hour or so, you're going to say yeah. hi and maybe, maybe say something that recognizes the situation you're both in, like the weather's on this one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you're in the center of London, then th- there's no expectation to give anyone a stroke because there's just too many people. It would get ridiculous. So yes. slight, yeah. slightly depending on culture. And yeah, so maybe if you're with work colleagues, um, there's a expectation to give everyone you see at least a daily stroke if you see them. But yeah, if someone's been away for like three weeks, then there's a sense in which you owe them more than one stroke. I think he says it yeah. should be at least like an, an eight stroke interaction. It's like, oh, yeah. nice yeah. tan. Where have you been? Uh, how was it? <laughs> how was the food? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think that it's kind of considered like small talk, but there's no, um, like whether you want to actually know how their holiday was or not, you mm. you're obli- you're obliged to stroke at least. Yeah, it's kind of like a social contract. Twice. I guess yeah, that would yeah. be. I guess it would be a sort of well, it depends. I've, uh, rituals and pastimes sort of bleed into each other, depending on how much they get Im- improvised. Because he calls pastimes semi-ritualistic. So, I think if you're asking someone about their holiday, that would become a sort of pastime because the content would change depending, you know, holiday to holiday. Yeah, but a pastime is it's like, it's a structured interval of time. So I suppose if yeah. you were like having a, a lunch with someone after they've been on mm. holiday, that, okay. that might be more pastime. Whereas yeah. I guess ri- ritual is more kind of that crossing over, like maybe walking mm. past each other. Sort of thing. Um, yeah. He does say ri- rituals are adult to adult though. So yeah. what we're talking about here is, is a ritual, I'm presuming. Mm. Um, is that right? Yeah. So that'd be, there's sort of this, um, yeah, we're, we're speaking from our adult. There's just sort of a, it's just the way things are. And we're just talking with uh, me- meaningful intent and there's no ulterior motive. We're just mm. kind of doing what we feel like we're, we're obliged we should do. Or is that maybe a... Yeah, exchanging um, 
information back and forth without ulterior motives. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, okay. So we should, okay. Yeah. So you, you said about the hungers we have, so there's the stimulus hunger recognition and the structure hunger. And, um, I'm glad you brought that in cause that, uh, explains why we have these rituals, pastimes, games, and why we so much avoid intimacy perhaps as well, because it's it's a lot less structured. So it's a lot more comfortable for some people to be in a ritual or a pastime where they know the rules or in a game when they know the rules yeah. than it is to just be in sort of the open landscape of, of intimacy. Um, mm. It might so, be... Uh, oh, so you go. I was going to say, um, <laughs> well, you, to make sense of games, we first need to make sure we're on the same page with ego states and what they are. So yes. I was going to... Yeah. Okay. So that was my thinking. So that was how time is structured. And so, so if you think of it like, okay, here's how people structure time. We've just discussed that. I'll put that to one side. And now we need to understand like what people are like. And the way he does that is by splitting the ego into like, three states you can be in yes and like it's it's not just uh, uh an internal thing but apparently he, you know he says it's it's an observable change in your um attitude the way you speak the way you behave mm-hmm. and the, these three places we can call adult parent and child and mm-hmm. so when we're kids we we pick up what it means to be a parent from the way authorities treat us and we internalize that and build our own in kind of internal parent which is like a sort of caricature of a child's eye view of what parenting looks like and that can be a state we get into so you might see a little girl sort of playing with her dolly and depending on how she's been parented she might be telling the dolly off or telling it to go to school or or caring for it or whatever so that would be her coming from her inner parent um, and we also keep within us our our child, like what we, how we were as a child. We uh, that stays within us, and that can be a place that can still take the driving seat even when we're adults. And there are kind of two sides to that. You can have your natural child, which is free and fun and perhaps creative. laughing, creative, nat- yeah. natural, yeah. naturally expressive. Um, silly and then you can have your adapted child which has been perhaps um you know punished or is is adapting itself to get parental affection or whatever and this one might be a bit more ashamed or embarrassed or anxious and yeah modifying its behavior patterns under Mm. like the the parental influence that you just spoke about yeah exactly Yeah. yeah and that can still come up in you know modern uh as we're adults that part of us can take the driving seat when we get like embarrassed or get anxious about meeting new people or things like that and then finally we've got our inner adult which is um not emotional it sees things with reason and logic it looks at the facts and at data and it solves problems that way it's like our inner computer and it doesn't really have much motives of its own so it kind of needs to be fed them from the parent and the child Mm. Fed them from the parent and the child. Can you, can you expand? So their their way they appraise reality is fed from the, the view of the inner child and the inner parent. Or? I mean, my mean, what it? Um, so a computer can solve problems, but it doesn't have a motive. Like it needs to have something driving what what problems it chooses to yeah. solve. Right. So um, you know, let's say. Um, I don't know, you're a carpenter and you're um, calculating some angles you need to cut wood at. That that might be your adult doing those calculations, but the whole reason you're a carpenter in the first place might have come from your playful child enjoying making Lego as a kid or something. So its motive is fueled by the energy or in psychodynamically, you call it the libido of the child, but Mm. the actual procedure is carried out by the adult so it kind of needs the fuel from somewhere to know what problems it's going to work on but when it works on those problems it's just logical uses facts and data yeah i think that's a good um 
good words you've thrown in there, procedures, like uh, doing procedures and carrying out tasks mm. um, is a very adult, um, like comes from a very adult place. So when we're, when typically we we you know, when we're working or when we're, you know, focused on a, a single task or objective, it's more often than not mm. uh, done by the adult. Um, I wouldn't mind just adding in quickly, um, with the parent, there are two types of parent internalised mm. in the ego state. So there's the, uh, the direct parent, which is um, coming from a parent, say, doing as it was stated by the parent, like, you must do this. Mm. This is something that must happen, like a specific um, thing, task, activity. And then there's the uh, indirect parent, which is um, doing as the parent wanted. Oh, as yeah. opposed to as they they stated, so I mean it doesn't necessarily feel like there's a whole lot of difference, but um, maybe if something's as the parent wanted, that might not have been vocalised as much. But it's sort of this uh, <clears throat> parental approval, like maybe just some glances or just some mm. standards of behaviour that you were expected mm. to uphold when you're a child. Whereas the direct adult was like put your bloody seatbelt on or like <laughs> do this or whatever, you know, it's specifics. So it's kind of like, um, another way of seeing that might be the kind of do as I say, not as I do. They might be telling us to do certain things with their words, but they might be modeling something completely different. And so what they say might be the direct one, but what they're modeling, they're hinting at, we should do other things than from what they say. And you can imagine how that could confuse a child at a young age, right? If the, yeah. the parents like, um, you know, say shut up all the time, but then the parents are screaming at each other. Yeah. It's yeah. not very coherent, is it? It's kind of confusing. And then the child struggles to adapt to like yeah. what's right, what's wrong, what keeps me safe, what, mm. what, um, what doesn't. Uh, so I think that, that's quite important. And I guess that, that is the whole way in which um, he breaks uh, goes through all the different games, doesn't he? Mm. You know, t- he talks about the um, you know, the transactions around which ego state is being used at any one time in a transaction. Mm. So he says an adult to adult transaction is the simplest form, mm-hmm. as well as well as a child to parent um, mm-hmm. interaction. So even w- when he says child, he doesn't mean childish, but he means that you know there may be a um, situation where you're you're asking for some some advice, you're needing some sort of reassurance or parental guidance, and then someone gives you a parental um, response. Mm. Um, so he says those are the, the two, you know, they're complementary and they're appropriate to the situation. Mm. Adult to adult, child to parent. And he says when they start to get complicated is when there's, you know, cross transactions that, um, you know, someone asks an an adult question but gets a parental response or someone mm. asks an adult question and fires up the other person's child. I'm, I'm wondering if there are any, any other ones because I, I can see there's uh, yeah, cross transactions, complementary transactions and superficial ones as well. Okay. So those are the three main ones. I think, okay. So I'll just fill in some gaps. So we got um, each person then has their inner parent adult and child and so that's one person on their own but then if you get two people together they can talk and communicate to one another from these different states so i can be like interacting from my child to you for example and not not only can i come from that place in myself but i'm aiming that at the either parent adult or child within you so if i'm like um, I don't know, if I'm inviting you to play, it might be my inner child aimed at your inner child. And if you respond with your inner child, then that's that's a complementary transaction. So complementary yes. transactions are what we kind of expect. Um, whereas, as you said, another way, I might be in my inner child looking for advice, therefore I might be aiming at your parent. And mm-hmm. so, you know, a, a, a cross transaction is if we don't get that. So if I... Um, Aim for the parent, but get the adult. Or yeah, aim yeah. For the, yeah, yeah. Aim, aim for one bit of you, but get another bit back. Then, and so uh, I think I read one last night. It was like, um, so husband says to wife, "Have you seen my cufflinks?" 
and wife says, you're always losing everything. Like, why do you <laughs> bloody leave your Netflix all over the place? It's like he, that he came from an adult place aiming at her adult, an adult response would be, no dear, I hadn't seen them. But she came from a yeah. parent aiming at his child, kind of berating yeah. him. And she, she's heard it how, she, she's heard it as, mm. as what, like, child maybe like yeah. she's heard it coming from his child that he's just yeah. useless and can't look after himself yeah. or something like exactly. that yes yeah, so yeah. that, that reminds me a little bit maybe there's a link there between like um <clears throat> non-violent communication and having your jackal ears on oh uh, yeah or your, yeah. your your giraffe is like how are you hearing um someone like in that transaction mm. are you just uh treating them like a child so you hear them like a child or are you listening for the the adult question in there or the adult uh, mm. re- request mm. as well or even if you heard you know some child in there um you know maybe i don't know maybe the husband is um giving some public talk at some event and he's anxious and he, he's getting flustered over everything it's like have you seen my cufflinks it's like that might be his anxious child coming out, but still with, with those giraffe ears, you, you might come at it from a bit more of an understanding place rather than shouting at him. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of <clears throat> seeing, spotting the need, right. Mm, Hearing the need yeah. of where someone's coming from, where I think you know, th- this does kind of bring together the, th- the three we've done on communication, um, you know, listening for needs and feelings and that sort of thing, rather than just hearing, um, hearing a child or just hearing a demand or hearing the parent as well, you know, interpreting someone's request as a demand mm. um, as well. It's um, kind of, I guess, nonviolent communication would be a way to um, whatever game or pastime someone's trying to um, initiate with you 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 kind of stand your ground and respond with intimacy regardless Mm. of what what they're trying to do um that could be one way of viewing it yeah what what he he says um sorry eric burn in this book says that intimacy is encouraging others to share openly and talk Mm. freely yeah so i think when you speak um in non-violent communication I think we talked about some of the aims of that are in order so that the other person is responding from a place of openness and willingness Mm. and um, understanding. And I think that would certainly rub off on someone else. Mm. So I I wouldn't go so far to say that um, nonviolent communication is adult to adult communication. It it, it could be, it could be a, you know, as you say, when when someone's needing some parental guidance, when they're feeling flustered, it could be, um, just being aware that that's what type of communication is needed in that moment because yeah. the person has expressed a need from the place of the child. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I'd say non-violent commu- communication. Actually, I was going to say they w- it would be complementary transactions, but not necessarily. Um, if someone's trying to get a, a ruse out of you, someone's trying to wind you up, you might come at it from an adult place and that still might be a cross transaction, but it's almost like you're not playing into the drama. Um, so, okay. I think, I feel like that's a good place to really get into the games from. So now we've got why we need to structure time and we've got the, um, parent, adult and child states of any two people or more communicating with one another. Yes. And so um, I know you've already said it, but can you bring the definition of games back in with that in mind? Uh, Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so games are sets of uh, complementary ulterior transactions that progress to well-defined and predictable outcomes. So they differ to um, rituals, pastimes, and intimacy due to their ulterior quality and their payoff. So a set of, yeah, yeah. There's a concealed motivation, concealed gimmick, and mm. it's from an underlying need to seek validation or reassurance. Mm, okay. Yeah. So by ulterior, uh, it means in this ego states model that it might on the surface look like you're coming from say an adult to adult, 
but psychologically inside you're actually coming from another place and aiming at another place and someone else so that's the and, ulterior yeah and, and in order in order to get the stimulus hunger met mm. i think that's that's an important way to tie so there's there's a game that's going on so communicating in one way but actually you're trying to get a need met that isn't being communicated clearly to the other mm. person mm. so that could be yeah trying to whether it's yeah recognition you're needing some like sensory and emotional um validation or stroking mm. but you're communicating something very different mm. i think it's a good time for an example have you got sure, any favorites um, from the from the book i did, i wrote down i wrote down a couple i think um uh, they, they were, okay one is why don't you yes but oh yeah that was the first game so, they they came across, wasn't it? They analysed. Oh yeah, it's one of yeah one of those ones. So what he's what this one is is basically when someone asks for a suggestion mm. for a problem, say um, oh, I'm trying to think of a problem like I can't seem to um, fix my washing machine or mm. something like that, and they said in a group of people, and every time someone gives them a uh, a solution, like have you tried calling a mechanic? Have you tried taking this screw out, have you tried turning it on and off again? Like every time it's met with a, with a no. Mm. So it's basically the, the purpose of this is to reassure and gratify the child mm. and not in, but the only way they can do that is by not accepting any of the parental answers coming there. Mm. So every time they get a solution, they're, uh, they, they, they avoid surrendering. Mm. Yeah. So, and then, the, the only way that can really be counteracted is by asking, "What what are you going to do about it?" <laughs> yeah, that, so. that, yeah. Which which reminds me of another podcast we did, where the remember ah, uh, you have to tell me which one it was. Where the the guy was complaining to his psychology, the the lead psychologist about taking on too many patients, mm. and he was kind of he was asking for solutions, uh, yeah. making out like it was a massive problem, but then actually the way to was that the road less traveled. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And um, it also ties in a bit to the six pillars of self-esteem. Oh, yeah. Right? Personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Yeah. But um, I said, back to the game, I, yeah. I suppose the aim of the game is to prove to other people that no matter what they suggest, I'm going to say no. Yeah. Well, it's... And that, that, it's, that withholds that position. It really fortifies that world's view that no matter what anyone says, you can't help me. Mm. I can't be helped. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not as simple as no, it's yes, but. So it's, I've already thought of this and I have an answer why that wouldn't work. So like, you're also gratifying this idea that you've thought of everything anyone else can think of as well. Yeah. So the ulterior also- motive is you're going from, on the surface, on the social level, he calls it, you're going from adult to adult. I have a problem with my washing machine. Does anyone have any ideas? But the ulterior motive is actually your child is, playing this game trying to rope in everyone's parents to help so you can turn them all down and and win (laughs) when the room goes silent yeah it it basically shows that like yeah no matter what your parent the the parents suggesting Mm. things you're always going to reject it and Mm. i suppose just to lead on to another game that this ties into it's um the game where i'm only trying to help yeah so there's some people who um communicate from a place where like they really want to be the one to provide the suggestion and then mm. when that gets shut when the suggestion gets shut down mm. they can say i'm only trying to help mm. so i don't know, i thought that that's an interesting game that ties in as well when someone um someone needs to be seen to be helping mm. so yeah that on the surface they're coming from an adult place so it's like well here's a suggestion but really they're coming from a like i don't know what would it be maybe like a helpful parent role and really wanting that to be gratified and when it's not stroked by being able to give someone an answer it gets sort of rejected Mm, i can see some links into um you know codependent relationships there as Mm. well where people's entire uh um identity is shaped upon their ability to help other people and when that's taken away from them they've lost that whether it's structure that um uh you know that recognition as the caring role as mm. well yeah you take yeah. that away from 
Um, so there's two games. I mean, there, there's a couple more that I found quite interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for yeah uh, the other one I thought um, it's a little bit darker. <laughs> um, blemish, which is yeah. I'm no good. Yeah. Um, and that's a game where someone is trying to seek reassurance and safety and mm. avoids intimate intimacy at all costs because they don't allow anyone to become close. He says it's a bit more of a pastime sometimes, mm. but uh, I guess the person who plays this game blemish. Yeah. Um, I, I'm no good. We'll call it. I'm no good. Yeah. Um, is not comfortable with others until they find the other person's flaws. That's the kind of mm. deep down ul- ulterior motive is that like they, they need people to know that they're not good enough, but the mm. only way they can really feel good about themselves is if others have flaws. Mm. Um, did so, you, do you remember that one in particular? I'm, I'm struggling to remember how it played out. Do you, do you remember like the interaction or not? Yeah. So it's basically someone needs to be seen to be doing things wrong in order for their identity to be um, validated. Mm. So that they won't feel good about themselves um, until, until someone reinforces that. But the underlying existential motivation mm. is that they don't want anyone to feel good about themselves. They, mm. they think everyone else is flawed. They need to be flawed okay. like everybody else. Yeah. 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 Do you remember how it kind of plays out? Like, no, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, th- I think that's probably my best explanation of it at the moment. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm afraid, but I, I can imagine in this situation that there's this, uh, there's kind of, there's a ch- you know, coming from the child mm-hmm. needing, needing to be seen. So the only way someone realizes they can be seen is by doing things wrong. They've learned right. that when they make mistakes or when they're, they're awful, yeah. they get attention that way. And then there's obviously their, their needing um, a, a parent, you know, the, the parent side of someone to reinforce that by saying, yes, you're doing things wrong. Mm. Right, right, right. So I think that's probably the transaction going on. It's a yeah. child to parent transaction, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's not helpful. Mm. So there's a few there we go. interested me. <laughs> yeah. I was um interested like usually we we um when we get kind of a handle on it, we start kind of reflecting on um when we've noticed stuff from these books like in our own lives and um I think that's generally what's most helpful. I, I struggled a little bit with this. Um I think it, part of it is because, like, there can be an infinite amount of games. It, all, the only aspect is that there's this ulterior motive and a payoff. So it, it, he's certainly not making the case that all the games in this book are all the games there are. Like, they're um, depending on your culture and when you've grown up, there'll be different games that are played. So I think that's partly why it's more difficult to. Um, um, perhaps relate to it but i'll throw one at you which i I felt like oh that that felt like a bit of a game so when i was like a teenager um mum would often ask me what i was doing that day and i knew what she meant was if you don't have much on i want to ask you to work so her (laughs) so her maneuver was like okay i want you to work with me Uh, and uh can you explain guess, what a maneuver is quickly? Uh, yeah, so yeah, a maneuver, uh, well, at, le- at least how I've understood it is, it's, um, it's an ulterior move in the game to kind of s- to set the game up. Okay, so, yeah, um, great. So my makes this maneuver. Yeah, so it's like, okay, if she was going to come from the place of intimacy, it would have been something like, um, you know, I'm feeling like I might need a bit of help with work today. Would you be willing to help me? That that would be a straightforward open place. But so the, the first maneuver in the game is, what are you doing? T- hey, Luke, how are you? What are you doing today? <laughs> and so, you know, on the surface, that's just an adult to adult, like 
uh, request for some information. But, On the surface, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've I've also heard the maneuver. So now I'm thinking like, how do I respond back from my adult but from a place that says I've got all this going on, so you can't really ask me to work. So yeah. I'd, you know, I, I'd mentioned I couldn't possibly work. I'm so busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd I'd be like, oh well, I've got this revision I was planning to do, and then um, cool. yeah. <laughs> I, I might like have had, I don't know, I might have had rough plans to hang out with friends, but I might make it more specific, and then I'm meeting the guys at half two, and. Um, so, so I'm, I, I'm like setting up these obstacles to make it more hard for her to say what she, I think she wants yeah. to say, which is that, oh, oh. and then it becomes, oh, well, that's, I, I guess like I was kind of thinking maybe if you were free that um, I, I, I would, I, I would, uh, <laughs> wouldn't mind some help in help working today. And it's like, but it sounds like you've got a bit on. It's like, yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll see. I'll let you know if I'm free, but I've got these things I'm planning on to do. <laughs> that would uh, be a sort yeah, of, yeah. So that would be a game. I don't know what I'd call that, but um, when I tried to reflect on games in my own life, that's one that sort of sprang to my memory. Well, I think it's a really interesting point you made that kind of in response to, I mean, I hate saying this because I love you, mum. But like in response to your mum's game, like you've kind of come up with a game of your own, you know? So it's sort of like her game of like, ah, oh, is Luke busy? I'll try and find a way of asking in which he can work. But then you've come up with a game of like, how can I fool mum into not asking me to work? <laughs> or making, yeah, yeah. Her feel, making, her, making her feel guilty about asking me because I've yeah. got revision or something. Yeah, um, yeah. I, sp- I suppose when I reflect on how this affected me, has affected me personally, I mean, there's two, without necessarily even having specific examples, it's really, really made me think about like how many transactions that go on in our lives are just superficial and have underlying motives or just mm. aren't coming from a place of intimacy. They're not, they're not game free. They're not like liberated, open mm. conversations that are like encouraging each other to, communicate and I'd almost say like communicate with like non-violent communication mm, just mm. being straight exactly what is it that I want what is it what are my feelings and needs like so often more than not we're trying to communicate in that way and it's uh I think and even to link back to lying by Sam Harris I yeah. think we do subconsciously um know that people are doing that and we mm. respect them less and there's just kind of this ongoing transaction that we're mm. just we're not communicating authentically. There's always some ulterior motive and people hate that. People hate knowing that like someone's like, oh, what, what, you know, what, what are you doing later with the hope that, you know, you're mm. going to like help them move house or something. I mean, yeah, someone yeah. just goes like, hey, honestly, I, I'm, I'm struggling a bit tonight. I was wondering if you were free. I'd love some help. I've got a need to mm. move house. You know, I'm just making examples as I go along, but I, yeah. it, just, it almost is kind of it saddens me to think that people don't communicate authentically. Mm. in that way and like it made me realize to watch if there's a bit of a motive going on and mm. you know to link into the the bit he says about achieving that autonomy which is you know related to having spontaneity like being out being free to choose when i want to communicate on an adult level when when i mm. want to communicate from a parent level or or a child level like having that freedom to communicate honestly from each mm. of those different mm. different points and i think just that that general awareness of that and just being like, what am I trying to communicate here? What is mm. my true need? What is my true intention that mm. I'm trying to get across here? Because otherwise you could just spend your whole life playing games, lying, just having shit small talk, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I found it inspiring in that sense. Like it does tie together, although some of the examples feel a bit, um, I don't know how to describe it scientific almost mm. like in general it's basically knowing which part of yourself you're communicating from and watching your intentions mm. when you're talking that's yeah. really the two standout points for me yeah no i like that as sort of um yeah you could really get bogged down in the language and the models um but if what you want is to think about how this applies to you again applying that um mindful awareness that um when I think about the six pillars, the that uh, the practice of um, living consciously, the practice of 
personal responsibility. You're you're listening for how you interact, thinking like what what are your true motives for saying what you say and and um are you sometimes not communicating from a place of intimacy out of you know fear of vulnerability it's difficult for you to ask for what you want or to um say how you really feel or share your honest opinion so we're always trying to like feel each other out first so so as not to show our hand and it's like yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah thinking about just that in general might be a um a more productive way to take these messages away without having to memorize all the games he lays out absolutely i think um you know in terms of that autonomy he's talking about and that authentic communication we're we're saying you know he's saying it's about increasing choice and attaining control of where you're what you're saying and where it's coming from and we can we can reduce the influence of you know parental voices or child mm. ego states in our own lives like mm. we can become aware that okay crap this is setting me off like mm. i had a client today at work and yeah. um they they were particularly difficult um mm. for me to work with i was saying to a colleague that i just i found them particularly difficult because they they communicated from a very um bossy demanding mm. and uh i hate to say it but quite an entitled perspective so um, coming from their sort of critical parent <laughs> coming from, yeah exactly exactly coming from a critical parent and I, I found myself responding to that quite negatively and i needed yeah. to reflect on that like what part of me is responding to mm. this like is it um is it my, my child like times when i've been told off or maybe other experiences with authority in my life mm. that I responded to. And I think that was really, um, I'm quite happy with the level of awareness that, oh, <laughs> that nice. was shown at that point in yeah. time, because I was able to go like, I, I'm interpreting this communication as a, uh, as a, you know, the parent from her coming to yeah. me and I'm responding from the child rather than from the adult, which would be like, okay, this person is experiencing X, Y, Z. This may be why they're saying what they're saying. This isn't personal. This isn't against me. <laughs> you know, so it's, mm. it's interesting to see like how that that really affected my interaction. I actually needed to like step back from it. And even in my response as well, I could feel myself getting a, my response was going to come from almost like parental as well. Mm. Like I was going to come from a critical parent. So my, so her coming from her parent mm. down to my child, but then I'm responding from my parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to her, because I, I was feeling like I need to counteract this level of uh, um, antagonism from her. Yeah, yeah. But fortunately, I had that awareness and I, I left the situation. But uh, it was interesting what was bubbling up inside mm. of me in that moment. I thought it was quite interesting. That's a really good example. So, um, And it's, it's a really good one to highlight the point that although our inner child can get triggered we we often will defend it from our own critical parent because that's that's its yes. like protector so chances are this client was feeling vulnerable in, in some way yeah. and and came in with their critical parent to protect their vulnerability triggered something mm -hmm. in your inner child you wanted to come back from your critical parent and that now you've got this cross transaction and he would say that that would either when we have a cross transaction like that, either someone will cave and, you know, start crying and actually come from their child, in which case now it's complimentary again, or the, yeah. it, it will just, um, end and, um, you know, ends with slamming doors or something. Obviously yours didn't end that way. Cause you say you noticed it and, um, perhaps came from your adult and managed to sort of soothe it a yeah. bit. But, um, mm. I think it's um, interesting, like just to remind ourselves that like the ego state is also um, your viewpoint, your tone of voice, mm. your vocabulary. <clears throat> it's like a coherent system of behavior patterns as well. Mm. So it's not, not just you know, what we say, mm. it's kind of how we say it. So like the tone of voice, I heard that in the tone of voice, I could have responded in it. Mm. Like, um, kind of not brought my adult into play and realized, you know, where I was and what I was doing. Mm. Um, so yeah. And, and it's feelings as well. Like you, you can be, you can be feeling that um, fear in the child, but your vocabulary and tone of voice is coming back from the 
the adult. So sometimes mm. it's almost, it can be like crossed within ourselves. So you definitely make a good point there that it doesn't, just because it's going into the ego state of the child doesn't mean that's how the situation will unfold in your response. Mm. Yeah, we don't necessarily respond from the place because, well, because that, that would potentially be coming across as vulnerably and intimately like, like I feel really hurt by what you just said or something. It, it's easy yeah, to come yeah. and just attack the other person. I'll, I'll send out my critical parent to go get them back. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's that's maybe your experience of how uh, parents responded to you when yeah. that happened as well. So yeah, no, I'm really glad. Uh, really glad. I actually, had an example from today. I wasn't expecting. Oh, uh, good. To share that. So no, I'm glad. Uh, glad I've been able to come up with one. You reminded me of. So another way, when you're talking about ego states, it reminded me of a way I read, which helped me really grasp it in my mind's eye. So it was like, imagine, you know, this stressed mum trying to like help get her kids ready for school, but she was all like angry and flustered. It's like, come on, and I'm like shouting at everyone, all bumbling around the house. And then the phone goes and she's like, hello, Mary Smith. <laughs> it's like, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a clear example of a, a shift in ego state. Like there's mm. in this real critical parent mode and just shifts to adult straight away. It's like, you usually think when you're emotional and stuff, you need all this time to calm down. But when you can move between ego states pretty fast, if the situation requires it of you. Yeah, that's really, and I think that's um, probably an encouraging thing, isn't it? That to think that mm. we can, if we can um, gather some understanding of ourselves and our um, what what ticks us off, what fires us up, what situations demand different ego states from us, um, then then that's actually encouraging. You know that she knows that oh god, this is like this could be a client on the phone, so I need to mm. answer this properly. Like <laughs> if she's just carried her ego state from shouting at the kids, like <laughs> what <do> you want? <laughs> it's like. Good morning. Or <laughs> yeah, it's your workplace talking to you or something, you know? Yeah, yeah and I, th I think that's something um, I certainly have had to, um, whether it's coming from different ego states or not, but certainly like in, in the work I do, like we're often bouncing around the whole ward. So we just mm. kind of like one person to another to a different situation might be talking to different kinds of people. Mm. and um, I suppose it's how do you maintain some authenticity and communicating clearly and mm. intentionally without kind of letting the situation fire up different parts of you. Mm. Like mm. you can go into like a really big, large, scary meeting, but then go into a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a client afterwards and mm. then go and hang out with friends afterwards. Like how do we, how do we stay authentic throughout different interactions that mm. being? set off or responding in a way we didn't wish to and sort of dragging around that residue into the next situation yeah i wonder if there's some people who just get stuck in certain states for long periods of time maybe not forever I imagine certain so. people i know who's yeah seem quite stuck in the air the demanding parent or mm. the, the fright the frightened child or the yeah. uh, adapted child um and there'd be you no know, certain situations you know relationships would certainly mm. um, probably bring that out and people work. Um, yeah, well, sort of it, he's, he's kind of structures the book that way, doesn't he? The sort of work games, relate marriage games, um, like games party in different games. contexts, party games, yeah. Um, just be interested, uh, I suppose, as we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here, whether there's any examples from... Uh, consulting room or psychiatry some of the games you spoke about because i know your um your work might have some relation to some you're of asking those. me yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well I'll, I'll be straightforward and say i don't remember the names of the games from that category because i read this book about three weeks ago now and it's, it's lost to me but doesn't mean i can't answer your question or give it a go i think the most common one uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but is like clients um, suggesting or outrightly saying, like, I'm going to be this way forever. There's nothing I can do that will help. Mm -hmm. And then that that's inherently contradictory 
from paying and showing up to a therapy session. It's like, if you yeah. really believed there was nothing you could do, then why would you just throw your money down the drain? So a part of you must think there is hope for you to be in this situation in the first place. Um, and so I, I often, when I hear things like that, when I hear words that contradict behavior, it, it's, I might not think of it in these terms, but they're, they're, they're lights go off for me of like oh this is this some sort of maneuver in a game what's going on here for this contradiction to be taking place and um maybe it's like they want to engage you in a game of yes but for example where it's like Mm. uh that's probably a really common one for perhaps new therapists to fall into where they keep offering suggestions of things to do and the client just tells them why that wouldn't work (laughs) Um, and it's kind of a i think he gives an example of like well i some psych- psychiatrists or sorry, psychologists or yeah. psychotherapists would, would say, well, I've suggested everything, you know, I've done all I can. I'm only here to help. I've just mm. done what I can do. Yeah. Um, you know, to avoid that confrontation of actually mm. like, Oh, maybe there's more I could have done. Um, mm. Yeah. So he says, um, so just, jump, he says like an adult way of communicating um, as a, a helping clinician, I suppose, use the example mm. of psychiatrists, but he goes, an adult way of communicating that is, I will apply what therapeutic procedures I have learned in the hope that they will be of some help. <laughs> uh, hope, sorry, hope they will be of some benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the way I might approach that is something like, of course, it, it really sounds like you've um, you've got no no hope and that you're just destined to be this way forever and nothing can be changed about that. Is, have I got that right? It's like, yeah, was, okay. Wow, that sounds like a really, you know, hopeless place to be. It's like, rather than ga- engaging in the ne- game of yes, but, and often from that, I don't like to phrase it in this way, but a client could cave <laughs> in a sense and like not play the game anymore and be like, oh, well, I guess like this could, but uh, some people might not and you might just get that awkward silence, like you've empathized it back and it's like, you haven't given them that, what they wanted, the, um so at that point i might just name it and say like it's interesting that on the one hand you you believe it, this is all hopeless for you and on the other hand you're coming to these sessions i'm wondering um how you think these could help you or how they how have they helped you so far um and if because it's it seems like some part of you believes there's a way you might be able to change or get some help and hopefully that sort of breaks the game but um yeah yeah i think um something this book did inspire me to do um i think it's probably inspired me in more ways than i realized but uh it's made me really when i'm listening with someone try and connect first to where they're coming from Mm. um before trying to provide a solution Mm, mm. so I think my, my my tendency just in life in general is to kind of fix things, find the solution, jump to the uh, jump to the problem solving role. Um, whereas opposed to being, if you're in that listening role in a helping profession, like going, you know, just making sure where is this coming from? Is this from the child? Okay, which part of the child is this coming from? Is this coming from the parent? Like mm-hmm. really trying to hear out where that's coming from and what that experience is. Mm. And also, I suppose in talking about it, maybe trying to hear where they're coming from from different parts of their ego states. Mm. So, like, mm. what would your what would your child say about this situation, or what would uh, if you uh, saw what you were doing as a task, how would you approach it? You know, mm. trying to b- before trying to suggest things because I guess some people get quite stuck in certain ego states, mm. and not see it from other parts of themselves. And I think that's what talk about you know if one part of yourself could talk to another what would it say yeah yeah you know that that compassion you know, linking back to a bit around you know acceptance and commitment therapy yeah we come in, in a happiness trap around you know what could your uh your nurturing parents say to your scared child yeah 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 moment as well yeah uh, another way to initiate that is to say like because often we can get so blinded in our own problems but if someone else, a friend of ours were to have the same thing, we might have plenty to offer. So uh, just to take yourself out, you could offer something like, well, you know, if, if your, um, if your friend was in this position and saying that this was hopeless and there was nothing they could do, um, 
what kind of thoughts would you have when you when you saw them in that way and kind of trying to trigger their adult to come online to um because we don't because when we're not in the situation we like to feel like we're in the know and that we we know how the world works and we have suggestions and all that but probably most people's adults have all the same answers so actually when we jump in to try and fix things we're sort of implicitly saying like I don't trust your adult to be able to come up with the same answers I can, which isn't always it, the case. It, it, yeah, it could be quite disempowering, couldn't it, as well? Mm. Like if the answer was there all along, but then you're the one who's come up with it. Mm. And what, what are you trying to what are you trying to prove there that you came up with the answer? You know, mm. there's certainly be some some people in helping professions who uh, their identity is reliant on being the, the problem solver and the saviour, that yeah. sort of thing. It's made me think about, you know, what, why do I do what I do mm. as well? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I can kind of get it all into that, but I, I certainly know it's coming from a good place and it's not from a, trying to save people, <laughs> certainly, mm. like having looked at some of the examples he's given there, like I didn't relate to those at all. Just, uh, mm. Yeah. And um, I just want to... Um offer the other side of the coin to that to that thing about um encouraging people's adults in that there are are some genuine times where we just go to experts because we know they know more so we might go to a mechanic of a broken car or, or or a dentist because we're not sure what's going on with our teeth and you know, it'd be, it would obviously be inappropriate for them to be like, well what do you think <laughs> it's like <Yeah>. um, <laughs> it's like so there are some uh frank and straightforward interactions where we do just genuinely ask for help um because yeah. we believe someone has the expertise that we don't and that, that's okay and um yeah but that, we, that procedure would, as well you know yeah you would know it was a game if like um i don't know some sort of smug man went to the mechanic and said i can't oh, I don't know what's going on with this. And then the mechanic provides you, so yeah, I've tried that, I've tried that. And actually the guy's a mechanic himself and he's like... Um, yeah, yeah, gets just, off and seeing everyone else be wrong. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. that, that's kind of the um, opposite of that. <sighs> nice. Well, I, I, I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling like we we got a lot more out of that than maybe we realised when we first chatted before going online today. I think that was yeah. Uh, there's some great examples came from that, and I'm actually feeling quite uh, quite happy about how how this went and some of the oh, uh, good examples we shared. Yeah, a part of me like I know I haven't ingrained this as well as I would have liked, and um, a part of me was a bit apprehensive about doing the podcast with that in mind, and and in a way I would like to have thought more and integrated this more in like my life because i'm sure i play far you know i think i've only mentioned one game and it wasn't even one i've initiated so i'm sure i play games and um would have would have i would still like to and 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 am encouraged to try and like work out where i sort of um avoid intimacy by playing these games in my own life and um i think it's a a good thing to do for like self awareness um but no like you said i I still have i've I've still feel good for have have, for having had this chat and like i still feel like i've i've been more encouraged than before we started yeah nice nice i I think there's um there's definitely you know some reflections you would have done over the years that would Mm. inform some understanding that when you know, next time you notice yourself reacting in a certain way or communicating in a certain way and pausing and going, okay, which part of me is saying what I'm saying or doing what I'm doing, um, you can reflect on that and go, okay, maybe that's, uh, maybe I don't like being told off or maybe I don't like being told what to do. Mm. Or maybe I, maybe I feel scared. Why is that? What, what is it about this person that's making me feel this mm. way? Mm. Not all, I shouldn't say that, making me feel this way. Talk about that last week. That <laughs> um, uh, is triggering me. Uh, yeah. That is the the stimulus for my reaction. Yeah, it's a nice way of putting uh, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. the The next book we're going to do will be up on screen now. As uh, <laughs> we, are, we are yet to decide, but um, yeah, it might be 
might be a few weeks. I'm off on annual leave next week, so I'm uh, going to enjoy that. But um, mm. yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next one. And um, yeah, I think this wraps up nicely our communication series and uh, hopefully more to come in the future. Yeah, nice one. I look forward to integrating this and coming back to this topic a few months or even years down the line. Awesome. And uh, that's uh, podcast number 20. So uh, I've, I'm feeling really, uh, really happy with how we've used our, our lockdown periods. It's yeah. Really nice. I thought where we've, yeah, we've me done too. 20 books in, uh, call it what, six, six months. So six, seven mm. months potentially. So that's, um, yeah, well, we do the math. But yeah, I think that's a good effort. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> awesome, mate. All right, nice one. I'll uh, chat to you soon. Uh, much love. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.